Hello, everybody. So today I am going to discuss how to make the periactoid. A lot of people have asked me about this. Uh, I'm going to show you my method. Um, there are a couple other methods if you Google this out there on the old internet. And they kind of have you putting together pieces of like one by four pline with some kind of corner blocks or something like that. And uh, I'm going to tell you that's... Uh, a waste of time I guess but it's you're not going to get the best results this is how I've always pretty much always built periactoid and it's always worked out for me I start with a sheet of plywood and the secret of periactoid is to get the, the flattest sheet of plywood that you can it'll make your life 10,000 times easier if your sheet of plywood is flat if you go to lumberyard and get something and it's got a little bit of potato chip in it Put it back. You may need to, like, if you go to a Lowe's or a Home Depot, uh, that plywood there is not always, I don't want to say, it's not usually put out on the shelves properly. Sometimes it's it's been in a couple different climates for the last couple days, so it's always in a state of acclimation. So sometimes if I'm going to make these, especially if I'm going to make them to sell them, I'm going to probably go get some cabinet-grade plywood, which will probably run you $52 a sheet. But... With uh, each sheet of, of a cabinet grade or any sheet of 4 by 8 plywood, uh, you can make one periactoid, the frame, for that out of that sheet of plywood, and then you just need three sheets of Luon. All right, ready? All right, so here we go. So in the this module, there is a periactoid PDF. That has all these drawings in them. Please be aware that you will, since they are PDFs, the chances of you being able to scale them are uh, slim to none. However, that if you take a good look at them, which we're going to go through them right now, uh, the, if, as long as you understand the concepts, you'll be able to successfully build these. Okay, ready? Great, here we go. So you have this first drawing in there. And so these are all the finished pieces. There's a bottom for each periactor. You make one. There's toggles. Essentially what I'm calling them a toggles or center frames. You're going to make two and there's a top. You're going to make one. You could, if you wanted to, make three of these toggles and not one of these. But the toggles are essentially, or pardon me, or likewise, you could make three of these and none of these. How I like them, since, especially since we're going to be moving these around a lot, I find that taking this little chunk of plywood out of the middle it saves a little bit of weight. These can be a little bit awkward because I, I don't know. A triangular column seems to be one of the most difficult things for students to carry. And once they get their casters on them, you can't roll this. It, it spins in one direction, and that direction is around. All right, so let's look at the general concept. So let's look at this. So you're going to cut these pieces out. And what you're going to wind up with. Here, I'll show you how to cut it out of a single sheet of plywood. This is the next drawing. So if you get a sheet of plywood, you're going to do some math first, and you're going to figure out what your triangles are. If you're making one up to three foot wide, you'll have no problem getting, uh, with these size here being three foot, you'll have no problem uh, getting one column per sheet. Tools that you'll need to do this, the minimum tool that you'll need to do this is a circular saw. You could also maybe, maybe, maybe do it with a jigsaw, but I don't think that would turn out very well. If you had a table saw along with your circular saw, you would really be golden. Because out of this one sheet, you're going to cut your three pieces here. It would be a top, a bottom, and two center pieces. And then you're going to cut three strips here up top. The three strips up top, I'll show you where they play into, and each of those needs a bevel. A bevel is an angle cut on the long side of a board. All right, so after a little bit of math, you'll come up with how big the, your, your sides are. I can help you with that if you're struggling. And so with those pieces, you're gonna wind up with, with four of them. You're gonna wind up with four triangles. They're all 60 degree corners, so every one of these is 60 degrees or 30 degrees off of this angle. 
And so let's say this is the basic shape that you have that. With that, once you cut this guy here, you're gonna find the center. It's easy to find the center. Before you cut out these little notches, just get a square and line it up and draw a line across here. Get a square and draw a line across here going to this point and draw a square with a line going across here at the point and you'll wind up with your center. All right, you only need this to do this to one. So you're just gonna mark the center as cleanly as possible. So let's say over here you've done that and you've marked your center. Then what you're gonna do is you're gonna lay out your, your casters. So the casters, like this one right here, there's a link in the description of where you can buy these guys. I only use these Colson Performa casters. I get them from BMI Supply in Queensbury, New York. Uh, they're usually about 15 bucks a pop or so. Uh, they have rubber wheels. They've got some, I think it's got a Darlin bearing inside. These are quiet and smooth and each capable of handling about three or 400 pounds. This is a four inch caster. The diameter of the wheel is four inch. The thickness of the wheel on this guy is at an inch and a quarter. You can also get three and a half, or I think they go down to three, or three and a half inch casters. They're a little bit smaller if you're on a little bit of budget. I think they, maybe that'll save you two bucks. You don't want to get too small on the casters, because if you get too small on the caster wheels, let's see if it'll do this here, you might not be able to roll over stuff in case you were to counter it. The bigger wheels have an easier idea, or easy time rolling over them. With periactoids, turntables, and everything that you lay down with some kind of pivot point, once you build it, you will not be able to uh, clean underneath it. So if you have to be really, uh, I use the word paranoid, about what's going on in your shop or on your stage, make sure no screws, screws drop under there, roll under there, because then you're in a bit of a situation. And if you find yourself going bump, 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 or maybe you're, you're stopping and dragging the wheel, you need to back up a little bit, maybe stick a stick under there if you can, or compressed air if you've got an air compressor and a nozzle and blow that whatever that particular obstruction is out of the way. All right, these holes here, let's see if I got right here. So when you get to the bottom, you're gonna just make sure that you find the center point. You know, you can draw a straight line all the way out here. And I like to try to put my casters as close to the outside as possible. Again, this is just the plywood without the skin on the outside. So I'm gonna to try to get that as possible to the outside. So here I have cut, where am I going here? Right there. So here I've cut a little sample one. Again, all the corners, 60 degree corners are all the same. Here, pretend I haven't drilled my hole here for the center. And I'm gonna take, maybe I'll draw a line out. Let's see. I'm gonna try to get my caster. I give my students a rule. I wanna try to get the caster as close to the edge, but I never wanna get closer than the thickness of a pencil to the actual edge or the thickness of a pencil from the wheel to anything. I'm trying to set a tolerance there, especially with swivel casters that spin around. Oh yeah, I make sure students are checking that all the way around. They don't buy a pencil. Uh, well, anything skinnier than a pencil. Pencil is usually about five sixteenths of an inch. That's making me real nervous, but I wanna to try to be pushing my casters as far off to the edge as possible. It'll create a more stable structure. So we draw all that. So let's say if you're gonna do this out here, you can lay them out. You gotta make sure this is 90 degrees off your line. And then you come back and nice and clean. Draw some circles, or in this case, ovals. These little guys have some oval holes in them. Gives you a little bit of wheel room. All right, so then you can drill those out by hand. When it comes time to bolt them on, I usually use hex heads. What, you should have a pile of these in your shop. So your hex head's head, you need a washer on both sides. And always, 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 since this is a periactoid, is a piece of scenery that's moving, I am using, let's see if it'll focus there. I always use nylocks or nylon inserted nuts 
You can see in here there's a little white bit. That's a little nylon ring. As the bolt goes, the, the threads of the bolt go through that, they kind of cut little threads in that nylon, and it makes it virtually impossible for this guy to wiggle loose and your caster to come flying off to in the middle of the show. In my professional career, and along with the standard, is anything above anyone's head gets a nylock. Anything that I'm never going to be able to touch again gets a nylock. Anything that makes me remotely nervous, I get a nylock on it. They cost, yeah, do they cost a little bit more? Yeah, probably twice as much as regular nuts, but I am not losing sleep at night for a couple pennies. Okay, and so yeah, so on this guy here too, some people say, can I use swivels? No, you cannot. You need fixed casters. Swivels, as you turn them, if you watch the video on casters, as, uh, on your, uh, let's see, it's a material, the material module. Swivels want actually want to make a little turn, so the whole entire thing will kind of go like this. Oh, that's kind of bad because we have a pivot point in here. So let's see if I've overstepped any. All right, so let's go back to the construction method. Let me back up a little bit. All right, so you cut those triangles out. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take a piece of a one by, well, one by or plywood, if you do all plywood method, you're going to take a piece of plywood and you're going to cut a 30 degree bevel on the whole entire piece along the eight foot piece. And then you're going to take that one piece, you're going to make one as a template. Pretend that this corner was still here. You're going to place it down over that corner. You're going to... Uh, that's a terrible shot. Uh, all right, all right, I got, I, got I got it. You're going to place it over the corner. Sorry, I'm doing this upside down and backwards. Uh, right here in the corner, right? And then you're going to trace that out. You're going to do that to all the corners. You can cut this out with a cirque saw. You just overcut a little bit. You just cut in here, right? And then you come back here and you cut in, you overcut here, you get a nice clean corner. Be careful, circular saws are extremely dangerous and you need to have been trained on one before you uh, start using them. I would if I'm going to make a bunch of these. I am going to perfect one of these. I'm gonna make it perfect. Make sure all my pieces fit in. You're going to need a table saw to rip this really clean. If you have a circular saw, you can make a circular saw guide, which I'll post a couple links to of how to make it. It's just out of a piece of plywood and a piece of one by. Or you can even make it out two pieces of plywood. And you get this nice clean bevel here. So what you're going to wind up with in the end is all the corners on all your pieces are going to be knocked out. I do all the pieces getting knocked out. Uh, it makes life easier. I feel that I get a little bit more resistance here on turning. Even the bottom, like this. I feel I get more glue space. I get all this side here, right? If you, you could, you could say, hey, I don't want to glue this on the, or I don't want to cut this corner out. I just want to place my, my piece here. All right, you can do that, that's easier but you still have to notch out all the other ones. And end grain, so this is the end grain of the wood. You gotta think about the actual structure of lumber. Wood doesn't look like it, but it's actually just a bunch of series of fibers, right? They're like straws. And so the end grain of wood really soaks up glue. So this glue joint here is not as strong as this one here. One, I get a little more glue surface, and it's gluing to the, the face, which is not does not have the open grain structure like the end grain. All right. Let's talk about the center. Okay, so that's in this drawing right here. How to attach this? I would use, if you're in the hammer and nail level of technology, I would get some number six box nails and nail those. They're really skinny and they're an inch and a half long, so they'll get in here. Just got to make sure that you don't nail through here and, uh, you know, have the, the nail poke out the side. But definitely wood glue all these joints. I 
All right, let's talk about the pivot point. So these guys have to spin on something. Here's the actual pivot point from what I have at Longwood. I've got a pipe flange. You may also see this as like a handrail flange. Uh, there is a link to it in the description below. These are a couple bucks and you need a section of pipe with one end is threaded. You can usually get these at Lowe's or Home Depot. Sometimes they're called pipe nipples. You can maybe get a six inch pipe nipple and that'll be threaded on both sides. Forget about the top, You're not, you don't need to worry about it. But down here, uh, it wants to be threaded so you can thread it into itself. And then you'll get some lag bolts or some really healthy screws, like some number 12s. No drywall screws for this, please. You don't want this to snap if it comes underneath any uh, stress. And so let's see if I can line that up directly. So then you're just gonna lag it to the floor a couple times. Remember, if you're using quarter inch lags like you use here, you're gonna wanna pre-drill with an eighth inch drill bit. It'll make life easier. You can see on this one here too, uh, I actually went back with a sander and I kind of pot like sometimes the finish on a piece of pipe may not be particularly smooth. I went back and I just buffed it out. So it's, you can see it's nice, shiny and smooth. I usually don't use any kind of lubrication on this because it's metal on wood. And so there we go. So I've got that guy cut out. I've got that guy fabricated. What he'll do is he'll come in and he's going to go on this hole on the bottom triangle. So this is an inch piece of inch and a quarter pipe. It's not actually an inch and a quarter on the outside. Inch and a quarter refers to the inside. So, or sorry, it refers to the outside diameter. Oh, hold on. Inside diameter of the pipe. It's actually, if you look at the inside, let's see if I can line this up. Inside, it actually works out to be an inch and three eighths on the inside. So that's ID. The OD on this works out to be an inch and five eighths. All right, so I don't want to drill an inch and five eighths hole here. I actually drill an inch and three quarter. Does that make it sloppy? It gives me a sixteenth of an inch all the way around for some wiggle room. The sixteenth of an inch is not going to kill your show. It also helps when you actually put these on. When you put these on, uh, be aware this is a pinch hazard. People are going to pick it up, maybe put their hands underneath. And then we're going to pick this up and we're going to try to find this hole and then stick it in. If you have access to a router that you can bevel this edge, cut a 45 degree bevel all the way around it, that'll help it as you slide it around, find its spot. Also in the link in the description, you can do this an inch and a half pipe. Uh, I've done everything here at Longwood. I do a lot with inch and a quarter. One of my predecessors seemed to have bought purchased uh, an incredible amount of inch and a quarter pipe, so that's what I'm working with. Inch and a half also works. See what you got around. All right? You don't need anything else besides this hole. It's going to spin on this hole. All right, let's look at the rest of this. All right, so let's look. Let's go back to... All right, so we're going to go back this drawing here you can say this one right here I've cut out the corner I've indicated you know that I'm cutting this out do 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 here a little dash line telling you I'm taking away from it usually you are you don't have a piece of one by or plywood plywood three quarter inch plywood is actually a little bit skinnier than one by but we're gonna call it three quarters for that because you're just gonna trace it the minimum you want for this piece is two and a half inches so if you have one by three, which is three quarters of an inch by two and a half and a table saw, go to town, just rip it out of that. If you had one by four, three quarters of an inch by three and a half, just go to town, rip a bevel on it, and you'll be golden. You can adjust this to what you have. All right, so let's look at the final project. So let's see how this guy winds up. So you're going to wind up. One corner. Maybe I'll just get two corners in the shot here. One, two. Here we go. 
So you're going to build the frame up like this. And you're going to evenly space. Here's this one. Let's put this the right way. So here's the drawing here. So this will rep this piece here will represent the bottom. The top is the same thing without the holes in the pivot point, which could be the same thing as these two sections if you want. Again, I usually cut out the middle of them just to lighten the load just a little bit. It doesn't at time and it, it doesn't really matter. It just cuts, you know, a smidgen out. So I attach this one, the first one at the bottom. Let's look at the drawing here. So I've represented my casters here. And then here, if this is eight foot tall, you're always gonna give yourself a little bit of a gap at the bottom. I would give yourself three quarters of an inch at the bottom. Anything less, well, you are into a real pinch hazard, especially working with kids. And so what you have to do to figure out that three quarters of an inch is you need to take the height of your casters case of this caster, maybe five, let's call it five inches. All right. So in this case, to get that three quarters of an inch, this distance from here to here is going to be four and a quarter inches. That'll give you a three quarter inch stack. Stop at the bottom. So your piece, let's see, let's see if I can, let's see if you can actually see this. There's my piece. Here's my caster. And let's shove that back a little. So you're going to wind up with something like this. And then by the time you get your Luan skin on, <laughs> that's a silly camera. All right, so by the time you get the Luan skin on in here, whew, all right, the whole entire thing clears. know if that is sorry for awkward but it's I'm using a document camera all right so first you build the whole entire frame it's essentially going to wind up to be a four sided or three sided flat and then let's talk about when then you're going to bolt the casters on again you're going to be using nylocks because you don't want them to be wiggling free And then you're gonna have to skin this bad boy. If you have a table saw, you can cut the actual bevels in the corners of the Luan. If you don't have the table saw, just cut, just square cut your pieces. And I told you right here in this drawing, fill this little gap with joint compound and then just sand it. It'll look nice. So in practical application, show this. All right, here we go. Perfect. Practical application. One side is going to go to here. The other side is going to go a little bit past. And then, I can spin this guy. All right, so see, I got, the, I got this little tiny bit of gaposis right here. A little bit of gapos is you're just going to fill with some joint compound and uh, go to lunch and come back and buff it out. I guess you could if you wanted to. You could kind of go like that, but uh, you're not going to be able to putty that. So something like this, I think, is your best bet. And then you're going to be fairly liberal with the glue on this surface here and on this surface here. You can put this together just like uh, if you had pneumatics, you're just going to use some three quarter inch narrow crowns, or you can use some three quarter inch tacks, brads. And as you do this, on this side at least, you want to make sure that you're zigzagging your uh, pieces. Or you're, sorry, you're zigzagging your fasteners because the, the purpose of the fasteners is to hold the Luan to your upright here until the glue dries. Okay, so in the end of that, that's how you make the periactoid. Uh, 
if some of this was a little bit confusing, uh, let me know and we can set up a time to talk about on uh, Zoom. We'll talk about how to go over it. And if you wanna make these taller than eight feet, all you essentially have to do is at your eight foot spot where your, your toggle or your center brace is gonna be. Let's say pretend this was eight foot, you just need to add some framing down below that would actually uh, create kind of like a hog trough in the similar manner that you would if you were making a Hollywood flat taller than eight feet. You can see that in the Hollywood flat that I made, the video that I made uh, that Dakota was nice enough to help me with. Okay, thank you very much. Please let me know if you have questions, comments, or snide remarks. Have a good day.